everybody. My name is Angie Peacock. I am a psychiatric drug withdrawal consultant and healing coach. It's quite a mouthful, but I help people who are coming off psychiatric drug from a holistic health perspective. Um, if this is your first time here, welcome to my channel. Please hit subscribe if you've been here before. I'm so close to a threshold for my viewers that that would really be helpful. Today we are going to talk about my views on therapy, trauma therapy, regular therapy, counseling, you name it. So these are the hit, these are the the topics I'm going to hit today. My own therapeutic experiences doing therapy, my training as a therapist, what that was like and why you should know about that. Somatic experiencing, which is a trauma therapy that I was trained in and well, one year of training and my thoughts now on therapy and psychiatric drug withdrawal and therapy. So let's get right to it. All right. My own therapeutic experiences. First of all, I have done probably how many years? 18 years of therapy, <laughs> believe it or not. I did some as a kid, some as a teen, when my parents got divorced, uh, some when I was going through stress in high school, um, and then in the military, at the very tail end, after my trauma, is when I started getting therapy, like, full time, basically. I have done, are you ready? EMDR, EFT, CPT, CBT, prolonged exposure, gestalt, emotionally focused family therapy I think that's about it those are the therapies I've done okay so I'm sure those are a lot of acronyms let me break those down I have done for trauma specifically my traumas have been uh, just so you know combat sexual assault sexual harassment domestic violence I was homeless I was addicted to opiates for about a year and a half because I was in benzo withdrawal and didn't know it I've never had a problem with alcohol um, just, you know, normal 20 something drinking. Uh, what else? Then I had, um, just like psych drugs just traumatized me for years and years. Anyway, so I've done all the therapies that you can think of. I have done so much therapy. It has basically made me into a neurotic self-focused mess. There you go. So I'm taking a long break as we are, as, as I speak, I'm like not doing any therapy right this second. So let me talk about some of those therapeutic experiences or therapy. I don't know what to what to refer them to, what to refer to them as. I can't speak today, um, but here's a piece of research that you all should know. It doesn't matter the modality; it's actually the therapeutic relationship that is what is curative or healing. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you could pick just about any therapy you want, and it doesn't really matter which one you pick. But if it's the right therapist, meaning you feel a connection, you feel like you can trust them, you feel like you can open up to them, that they understand you, that they validate you, that they see you and hear you, that therapy would probably work for you. It doesn't matter which one you pick. That's in the research. I'm not making that up. Speaking of which, I also had IFS, which is internal family systems. Okay, so let me break down some of these therapies. The MDR is the one that you do. It's bilateral movement on both sides of the brain. Usually they use a little flashlight in front of your eyes and your eyes will go side to side. In the research, it has shown that when your eyes are moving, both sides of the brain are being like engaged, which helps you process um, traumatic material and kind of put it back in its place. That's the theory. However, when you're on a lot of psych drugs, guess what? It's my theory, I can't prove it because there's no research about it, but it's my experience and a lot of my clients' experiences and a lot of people that I talk to, hundreds and hundreds a month, that say, Angie, I couldn't fully like, process what I was going through, what was in my past, and like put it away. Especially with benzos, and this is research-based, a person cannot fully engage in trauma therapy. In fact, EMDR therapy especially is not as contraindicated when you are on a benzo. Guess why? Because benzos especially make you a little like your short term memory is not fully um, engaged. It's got anxiolytic effects, amnesic effects, which means you're calm, but you can't remember and you can't put things away. So I will tell you right now, all those years of therapy, and maybe I'm getting to my point a little too soon, I couldn't process anything. I thought I was processing material. I really did. I really thought I was getting somewhere. But it wasn't like going back where it should. I just kept felt I kept feeling like I was processing things over and over and over and over and over. And then, oh, let's let's try it from the EMDR perspective. Let's try it from prolonged exposure perspective. Let's try CBT now. And now let's do CPT. 
And it was like I was doing all these therapies, but I couldn't fully process them because I was either on benzos, in benzo withdrawal, on other psych drugs, um, those whole 13 years especially. Okay, so buyer beware when you start engaging in therapy if you're on a bunch of meds. Okay, my personal experience, I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you what I and other of my clients have experienced. All right, so that's EMDR. However, I didn't do the one where it was like on the sides of the eyes because I had a brain injury. I've had three brain injuries, like concussions. One, I lost consciousness. The other two, I did not. It was just a really hard bump on the head. Um, so they say with concussion or seizure history, you should not do the lights. So I've done the buzzer kind where you put buzzers in your hands and it stimulates both sides of your body. Um, for some, they say the EMDR doesn't really work. It doesn't feel like it gets deep enough. But the basis of EMDR therapy is you're kind of talking about your trauma, you're exposing yourself to it, just like you would in prolonged exposure therapy, except while you are doing that, that bilateral stimulation is helping you kind of process and put those things away on both sides of the brain and kind of calm it down. So that's not so intense when you talk about it. You don't have like reactions to it if you think about it. Your heart doesn't pound when you see someone that reminds you of the incident, that kind of thing. So... That's EMDR. It stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. That's what the EMDR stands for. There are two schools that train EMDR therapists. I can't remember the names, but there's two different thoughts. Lauren Purnell. Lauren Purcell? Lauren Purnell. I don't remember, but my particular therapist was trained by her. So that's one therapy to think about. Another one is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So let me give you an example. I am walking and I see a man in an alley and the man's running and it makes my heart pound and it scares me and it makes me think about um, things in my past and I get like dysregulated over it. So a therapist would help you like kind of untangle that. So if the activating event would be I saw a man running, what did that remind me of? Or what did I tell myself about that? So I would say, oh my God, he's going to hurt me. I'm, I'm in danger. And then you would reframe that to say, no, this is, I'm safe. This is a different incident. This is not my past. That activation was just overwhelmed because my nervous system remembered what happened in the past. And then that would calm me back down and I would be more in the present moment. That is what CBT therapy is. There's a lot and a lot, a lot of therapists that practice that. But sometimes it can feel gaslighty because you're like, wait, I should react to a man in the alley since I've been raped. Like I should feel a reaction to that. That's not something I need to reframe necessarily. I could be gentle with myself and say, oh wow, that reminds me of something that happened in my past. I'll be okay. Um, I am safe. It's not happening now. That's cool. But it shouldn't be done in like a coercive way. Like you're thinking about it wrong because you were traumatized. Okay, so remember that. All right, next, prolonged exposure. I hated it. It was terrible. And let me give you a piece of food for thought. Basically, exposure therapy is you're going out you're making a hierarchy of uh, activating situations. So let me give you an example. Um, I'll just you give you mine for my own life. Walmart would have been like top of the rain. Like I can't do Walmart. It's too stimulating. There's too many people. It's too many noises. Um, uh, when I go there, I panic. I freak out. I'm in overload and I want to run out screaming. So you wouldn't go straight to Walmart on your first try. You would build up to that. So maybe step one is you pull in the Walmart parking lot and you just chill and you breathe and you try to like relax into it and be okay with the things that are happening. Step two would be like maybe you go to Hobby Lobby and you sit in the, in the foyer and you know it's not Walmart but it's Hobby Lobby. So it's like so much more relaxing so you could just sit there and relax and you're fine. Step three might be you go to Walmart but you talk to the greeter, you tell them to have a nice day and you turn around and you leave. Step four might be you just buy a piece of candy, you go through the checkout, and you leave. Step five might be you walk around three aisles, and then you leave. So you slowly, progressively build up to be able to shop in Walmart calmly, normally, without running out screaming. Okay, my experience with prolonged exposure therapy was my therapist did not teach me any self-regulation techniques. In fact, she told me not to try to breathe or relax myself or calm myself. I was supposed to sit there and let all the activation come and she didn't she told me not to do anything about it. But she didn't explain like you could write it out, which tells me a lot about the therapist in particular. Obviously, she's never had to do it herself cuz she doesn't know like she skipped a whole bunch of steps. 
but it's kind of like algorithmic and you just do this and it's not really fit for you. So perhaps I did get a bad therapist. I've since done some exposures on my own terms with my own way, not like that, okay? But in the research, prolonged exposure therapy, actually more people left and did not get it, which means you should learn, you should know this, they voted with their feet. It was so traumatizing for them, they did not complete the um, therapy, they left and they said, I'm not doing this. There's a reason for that. You should listen to patients that say they don't want to do this. It's traumatizing, right? Who knows why? There's many reasons. And maybe it's too activating. Who knows? But something to think about. So it can be a little overwhelming to the nervous system. And again, probably contraindicated with when you're on a bunch of meds. If you can't, if you can't regulate yourself, if you can't like bring things down when they're really super elevated, I know that's the goal of a lot of therapies. But if you don't have like a basic foothold in that, that's really hard to do. I mean, how are you supposed to be successful? You know, it's something to think about. All right, another therapy. I'm trying to go fast. Oh, what else did I do? Oh, CPT. So cognitive processing therapy. That's another trauma therapy. So basically what I did was I did one for my combat trauma and I did another round for my sexual trauma. So what that looks like was first I had to write out my story which in and of itself is very hard, very difficult, especially if you've had fresh trauma. And you write out as much as you can, as much as you can remember. Um, and I think they teach you a little bit of like um, calming skills before that, like how to resource yourself, how to like feel okay um, when you feel like activated, things like that. There's a, it's basically a workbook and you work your way through it with a therapist. So I did have some basic calming techniques on board when I did that kind of therapy then you write it a second time and I think I wrote it like over and over and over again and then at a certain point when once I'm done writing then I have to say it out loud and I cannot tell you how hard it is when you have therapy like or trauma deep inside of you that like especially if it's shameful or it's something you're embarrassed about um, and you write it down and you have to tell someone you have to say it out loud like what happened to you to me, there was a lot of power in that, but I was freaking terrified. Terrified, okay? So my combat trauma, that was all right. The, the hardest part about that was when you tell a civilian person who doesn't understand what it's like to be in the military, you have to like explain yourself a lot. And they don't have a frame of reference to understand what you've been through in that arena. So it's like you have to explain yourself more and you feel like they don't really get you. And I don't think that was helpful. However, in the sexual side that was very um I remember particularly there was something that happened to me and I'm not gonna say it don't worry <laughs> that was so shameful I was so embarrassed about it I was so disgusted by it that like I could not literally like as I, I can still remember this the the day that I did this like I could feel it like I could not even get it out of my mouth and the therapist really had to help me with that and was like Angie there's, you're safe here. I'm not going to tell anyone. You can say whatever you need to say. If you're not ready to say it, that's fine too. But I just want you to know I can handle whatever you have to say. Like I loved my therapist that helped me through that. And so when I got that out of my lips and out of my mouth, I mean, I feel less disgusted by it now thinking about it than I did back then. Like I could not even say it. It was like stuck in me, you know? So it was helpful for me for that purpose. All right. So that was CPT therapy. What else? Gestalt. During my training as a therapist, I did gestalt training, which means gestalt is very interesting. And I think you could do coaching. It's more of a present moment thing. You don't go back in your history. You don't talk about your trauma. You basically sit with the therapist and whatever comes back, comes up in the present moment, you talk about it. And if you guys have been in coaching sessions with me, this is basically how I coach it's it might be and it's I don't do it all the time but every once in a while like say someone is looking down I might say I see that you're looking down and then usually something will come up from that and the person will say like yes I'm really embarrassed or yes I am looking down like I'm really ashamed of this that I have to tell you or something or perhaps like the person's really quiet but I'm looking at them and they get really quiet and then I, I will I will say what I notice so it's very phenomenological which means I remark on something that's happening in the present moment I'm not going back and saying oh were you abused as a kid that's therapy I don't do therapy I'm asking them what's happening between us you and I right now um, so gestalt is like a very present moment thing and things like come from that moment like 
for instance, when I did a session with a therapist that I was training with, he looked at me and he, he just was staring like really intently. And I was like, why are you looking at me? And he's like, are you not used to being looked at? Are you not used to being the center of attention? And I was like, no, like it feels really like, I feel like you're really looking through me or something. And he's like, does that feel good to you? Like I'm looking at you. I'm, I'm interested in you. I'm really taking an interest. And it just felt like, so all my stuff came up in that moment because I was like, oh, I feel so exposed, you know? But to me, that was really helpful because, like, I don't have to go back and talk about my trauma. It's right here. It's always here. It's in my body. It's right here with me now. So that was um, Gestalt. I love Gestalt. If I could afford it myself, I would do it probably twice a week. I love it. It's just like an accordion, the way I think of it. Like, in this present moment, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, I don't have to go back or go forward. It's right here, right now. Anyway. All right. So then internal family systems. That's my last one. I did internal family systems for about two years. I also got a certificate in it, um, like a quick like intro certificate. They always do these like intros. You go get a certificate from them and then they want you to take the full course. But when you take the full course, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. Okay, you guys. So when you go to a therapist that's trained in somatic experiencing or trained in IFS, they spent thousands of dollars to get that certification, which is why most of them are self-pay. You have to pay cash. You're, you're paying them back for their training and all the supervision that they got. That's why therapy can be expensive, especially when it's specialized like that. Okay, so IFS is the thought that you have um, like different voices within you. So for instance, I might say on one hand, I really want to keep traveling. But another part of me says, no, you should settle down, Angie, and get married and have babies and like be normal. <laughs> So then the therapist might say, okay, let's talk to the part that wants to travel and wants to be free. And I might say, yeah, I just feel freedom and I was trapped in my house for a long time and I want to live free and I want to be as free as a bird and I don't want to be held back. Okay, let's talk to the other part. Okay, the other part of me wants stability and wants um, one place to call home and wants to feel part of a family unit. But I can't, I'm sorry, I'm at an event right now and now you can probably hear this music, right? gosh it's so annoying um so then they would they would look at what part of you is not letting express another part so perhaps there's someone trying to put the fire out so you feel very confused like I could go this way I could go that way but then there's also like the real you that's deep inside that knows what to do and it's usually the most loving and kind thing for you to do right now so basically the therapist will help you work through all the parts see which part is like what do they call it a um an exile like the part of me that I didn't take care of as a child that wants to run free and be rebellious that part's coming out but perhaps there's a firefighter part of me that is trying to keep it that muted and just be stable and boring and calm and stay at home so there's all these parts of you that you're trying to balance and there's parts that are exile and parts that put fires out and parts that are screaming and when I did that honestly it felt very like it made me feel more what's the word um disjointed and more too many parts like I was like no I want to feel like one person I don't want to feel like I'm five people in there and they're all talking to each other you know so I found that to be a pretty confusing therapy it was not my favorite but everybody has to find like which one works for them so that's IFS What's my last one? Somatic experiencing. Okay. Somatic experiencing. It's one of my favorites also. I did one year of training, but there's actually three years of training. I only did one. Basically, somatic experiencing recognizes that trauma that happens to your body is not always... You're not always able to process it through language. So let me give you an example. I had a client one time. I'm going to change all the details so you don't know anything about them. This was in my training as a therapist. This is not as a coach. Okay, this person was telling me a story about a car accident. And as they were telling me the story, they kept going like this. Like, as they were talking. And I was like, I noticed that you keep looking to your left. Like, what's that about? And the person said, um, oh, that's where the car hit me. And I was like, oh, that makes sense that your body remembers that. You know, so, like, you keep looking. So then somatic experiencing might work with that um, sensation in the person's body. And you might say things like... I'd like to invite you to be curious about moving backwards. Like, what does it feel to move backwards? What do you, is there a color to it? Is there a, 
um, sensation that pulls you like how far back do you want to pull is there anything you need to complete so for instance um, one of the teachings from somatic experiencing is when you happen when a trauma happens to your body especially like in the case of sexual assault or something some of us might freeze when that happens and when you freeze you beat yourself up like why didn't I fight back but we don't recognize that that's a state of the nervous system to freeze because think about an animal if it's getting attacked it wouldn't want to fight back because that would surely end in death so instead the nervous system would shut the animal down to play dead to actually save its life but us as humans because we have thinking brains we're like oh I want to fight back I want to hurt it back so maybe you didn't get to do that in your original trauma to complete it to like get some kind of resolution from it but you could do that later in a therapeutic setting so for instance if you were hurt in that way I've seen <laughs> and I've done this myself for my own sake like okay the therapist would ask me okay what did you what do you feel like you need to do to get some kind of resolution or closure for what happened to you and I might say oh I would do this this and this to that person and let me act it out and I this is how I would have like gotten out of that situation if I had a different choice or if I had a choice at all in the matter because my nervous system shut me down and I couldn't fight back in that moment so you can get very creative and very imaginative if you know what I'm saying um, that helps people just kind of like it's like you feel like a sense of power back and you got a little justice even though it's kind of imaginary your body doesn't know the difference believe it or not so that's somatic experiencing however this is my criticism of somatic experiencing especially going through what we have with psychiatric drug withdrawal um, somatic experiencing therapists are not trained to recognize like all the sensations in your body could be side effects or sickness or illness or maybe you need to go to a doctor and get checked out get medically cleared like what medications are you on your heart's beating really fast like is that normal for you um, so they they kind of ignore the role of psychiatric drugs and how those how bad they can make you feel so I've had many clients say I did all this trauma therapy I was doing trauma therapy on the sensations from tolerance to benzos okay that's not but they don't know that until later those therapists are not trained in that okay so you just have to be careful with this oh my god this is turning into a very very long video um, okay so that's the different therapies that I have tried um, do I think one of them fixed me no I will tell you right now a lot of this made me more neurotic very self-focused to the point like even now I'm always like uh oh I'm like thinking about this relationship a little too much or I'm thinking about this person or maybe I shouldn't feel this way is there somebody I need to talk to about that like it actually kind of in a weird way taught me not to trust myself but this is what it did help me do I think therapy and coaching especially are good for one thing and one thing only if they can teach you how to navigate your inner life and how to self be self and inquirous about like what's going on with me how am I feeling right now how does this person make me feel do I want to be in this relationship what does my body want like if it can teach you that excellent if you're relying on someone to interpret your experience that is not a good not a good thing you want to be able to interpret your and trust your own judgment not doubt yourself you see what I'm saying that's huge okay so that is my recommendation for therapy but there's tons more therapies out there I didn't even get into all the ones I said at the beginning I'm trying to make this a quick video and maybe we're gonna have to break this into part one two and three so I will break it right there that's part one all the different therapies that I have tried myself thanks again for watching and we will continue part two in a couple days come back to the channel and check it out